Now at 6, this is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. Good evening and thanks for joining us for the News at 6. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Bridget Bjorn. They're glad you're with us. A very chilly and windy start to the week. At times, several thousand Eversource customers were in the dark without power. Crews responding to calls of trees down. This was the scene on Spring Water Lane in New Canaan. Uh, Eversource on scene working to clear any blocked roads. So let's send it out to Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frank with a look at what we can expect throughout the night. Rachel. Yeah, winds will diminish as we head through the night tonight, but it's going to be a slow process. We've seen gusts up between 40 to as high as 50 miles an hour right now. While it's still windy, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, it's definitely less than earlier. We've got gusts between 30 to as much as 40 miles an hour, but still, with some of the higher gusts through about midnight tonight. We've got a wind advisory in effect through that time. And I wanted to show you the overall trend for winds, noticing their highest now and will continue to slowly diminish as we head through the overnight hours. So hopefully you can sleep a little bit better tonight if the wind was keeping you up last night or early today. Storm system is out of here. We've got dry weather in store in the days ahead. Overnight lows will be dipping back into the 30s as we head towards daybreak tomorrow. We're waking up to lots of sunshine as we head through the afternoon after morning lows in the 30s. We're near 50 by lunchtime with high temperatures climbing into the mid and upper 50s as we head through the afternoon. So a warmer afternoon tomorrow and that's just the start of a warming trend as we head through the week. We'll show you the numbers coming up. Rachel, thank you. New tonight, Hartford Police Chief Jason Thody is calling it, a, calling it a career and announcing today he is stepping down. Fox 61's Matt Carrion joining us live outside Hartford Police Headquarters with his legacy and the path forward for the department. Matt. Well, Chief Jason Thody told me that he plans to, quote, decompress once his successor is chosen, but he didn't rule out continuing his career in law enforcement, saying we will see what happens. Hartford is a city in transition. Transition can be stressful. A new mayor. Thank you to Chief Thody. And now a new police chief. It is with uh, mixed emotions that I share with you my decision uh, not to seek a new contract. Was the decision his alone or influenced by politics? This was a, a family decision. This was a you know, personal decision, a professional decision. Um, but no, um, you know, the, I think the mayor's great. Uh, I think he's going to do great things. Mayor Runin Arlampalam told Fox 61 the city will immediately launch a search for a new chief and engage with the community and stakeholders in a transparent process. We're going to have listening sessions all across the city of Hartford. We want to engage every community individually, talk about, dream about what public safety could look like uh, in this city and what the qualities we are looking for in a police chief. Are. After serving 28 years in total with the Hartford Police, including the last five as chief, Thody's tenure is tied to some difficult years. A global pandemic, the murder of George Floyd and the resulting demonstrations, increased violence, immense attrition and staffing shortages across the nation, and the loss of Detective Bobby Garton. The Hartford Police Department responded to each and every challenge with professionalism, empathy, and strength. Thody's departure comes during a time of success and turmoil for the Hartford PD. Under his leadership, the city has modernized its record system, prioritized transparency and accountability. It's nationally accredited and boasts a crime center that's the envy of others. But it's also facing severe staffing shortages, challenges with diversity recruitment and community trust. The role of police chief is one that requires a lot of public trust. and. We want to have as open and transparent and public driven, community driven process uh, as we can uh, in selecting the next police chief. Stakeholders told Fox 61 what they'll be looking for. I'm always mindful of individuals who are coming in who are relatable to the community in which they're serving. You have to be a part of that community in order to serve that community. Now, Chief Thody will be staying on until a new chief is selected, a process that could take at most six months. The mayor told me that he is willing to consider both internal and external candidates. He went on to say that uh, external, he went on to say that departments are, quote, an important tool in public safety, but cannot be the entirety of the approach. We're live outside Hartford Police Headquarters, Matt Karen, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station.
Matt, thank you. And new here at six, two people are facing charges and a third suspect is on the run. This all in connection to an alleged assault and robbery in Groton. Police say Angela Allen and Miguel Costa Jr. stole from a man staying at the Super 8 Motel yesterday morning just before 10. The victim telling police he was also hit in the head with a pistol. He was treated for non-life-threatening injuries. Police still searching for a third suspect tonight. And also in Groton, police investigate a crash involving a car and a motorcycle. This happened at the intersection of Aquanic Road and Rainville Avenue Thursday. You're looking at the area on the map on your screen here. Police say the 33 year old man on the motorcycle was seriously injured and taken to the hospital. No charges have been filed at this time. Anyone who may have witnessed the crash is asked to call the Groton Police Department. Hartford police making an arrest in connection to a shooting from December. Joshua Dupree is accused of shooting Christian Lopez on Franklin Avenue on December 23rd. Lopez was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. Lopez is being held on a million dollars bond. And Hartford police also making an arrest in connection to a homicide in January. Uh, Luis LeBoy is accused of shooting uh, Julius Rivera on Broad Street on January 11th. Rivera later died from his injuries. LeBoy is being held on one and a half million dollars bond. A $5,000 reward is being offered for information about a dog that was found dead in Coventry. Police say a pit bull was found dead in a plastic bin just on the side of the road. It happened on South Street on March 2nd with a gunshot wound. Officers believe the dog may have recently given birth as well. They also also believe the dog might have been there for several days before anyone even noticed it was there. If you know anything about this incident, you're asked to call Coventry Police. And Windsor Locks Police are warning residents about a rabid raccoon in the area. Police say they responded to a call involving several dogs and a raccoon, and that raccoon tested positive for rabies. Officials reminding pet owners that rabies vaccinations are required for dogs and cats older than three months. Day six of the trial of Trooper Brian North is now in the books as the defense called another witness to the stand. Fox 61's Julia LeBlanc has a breakdown of today's testimony. Do you know Trooper Brian North? I do. The defense calling Trooper First Class Craig Bresniak to the stand, a tactical coordinator with the Connecticut State Police. Did you train Brian North? I did. Trooper Brian North joined the tactical unit in November of 2019. Bresniak's testimony focused on the unit's training, digging into the firearms portion. Is there training relative to the number of shots fired? So we don't prescribe a number of shots fired for anybody. Bresniak says troopers even train on shooting in and around vehicles, like in this case, where prosecutors say North fired through the driver's side window seven times, hitting 19-year-old Mubarak Suleiman. Bresniak says in a scenario like this one, troopers may shoot more for accuracy, making reference to a game of catch through a window. The likelihood that that ball would go directly towards that catcher's mitt is very, very unlikely. Um, at which case I'd probably throw a couple balls to create a large hole and then get that accurate throw to you. In cross-examination, Inspector General Robert Devlin pointing this out. You have um, one round drills that you do? There are some, and generally those, those drills work on. So That's a yes or no answer, sir. Do you have one round drills? There are one round drills. Later in the afternoon, the attorneys took up a motion connected to the next two witnesses the defense plans on calling to the stand. Experts originally hired by the state's attorney's office in 2022 for an opinion on whether North's actions were justified. But that happened before Devlin was in charge of the inspector general's office. So he wanted that fact to be admitted. I had nothing to do with hiring these people. I didn't select them. I didn't uh, critique their credentials before they were selected. Um, and it's put on, on me, you know, th th their opinions, I think is, is unfair. I think that's incredibly relevant to know that the state sought an opinion. They received two opinions finding justification and they're disregarding them. Now, the judge ultimately ruled in favor of the state, agreeing that when those two witnesses take the stand, which is expected to happen tomorrow, their prior relationship with the state's attorney's office should not be mentioned. We are in Milford. Julia LeBlanc, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station.
And Julia, thank you. This short legislative session is already getting a lot done in committees. Here's what you need to know about today. The Judiciary Committee getting to work trying to clarify Connecticut laws. People relying on restraining orders are for safety are struggling to get them extended right now. And this because Connecticut requires evidence that the person violated the order and continued their abuse even to keep it in place. Lawmakers and advocates agree that's dangerous in the law. Lawmakers once again hearing hours worth of testimony about the state's funding structure for public schools. Local boards of uh, education cost sharing, uh, I should say, local boards get education cost sharing grants each year, but they don't know exactly how much money they will receive until after they've already started spending. Lawmakers now looking to require the state to tell schools what they will get by the end of each year. Another big topic is funding to improve bad air quality in our schools. Lawmakers, though, not sure how much they can do uh, with that budget spending cap already bursting. Some controversy over curriculum suggestions today. A proposal on the table to include a Greek genocide in high school history. Residents who testified drawing comparisons to the current war in Gaza. Turkish residents say they are concerned that this could increase bullying and hate crimes against Turkish students. But others say the teaching of genocide in general is important to learning empathy and human rights. And every year for years now, there's been an attempt to ban more and more books. And here, school boards are making decisions to pull books off library shelves, even leading to a bomb threat just last week. With that in mind, a few representatives have put forward a bill that would require the Board of Education to give the state a reason they're removing or restricting the books. Uh, but partisan politics, personal discomfort, sexual topics, or religion don't count. And author or character identities from race to sexual orientation would not be an acceptable reasoning. And all of these proposals still have a ways to go before becoming law, meaning there's still time to share your thoughts with those at the Capitol. For all of our continuous session coverage, be sure to download our free Fox 61 News app.